not, I'm not a conspiracy freak, but there is a concerted effort to undermine the Bible today. And if, just check it out for yourself. Go out to Google and just search atheists in the Bible, and you will see way more podcasts, way more articles, way more videos than you can possibly get through. And they, they are really going at it. They are pulling out all the stops to get you to question the Bible and actually not trust it at all. So they had their list, right? They had the, hey, the five wild things you'll find in the Bible or seven inconsistencies that you need to know about or, hey, the errors in scripture that everybody needs to know about. And they just hit it and hit it and hit it. And our culture right now is really down on the Bible. And so what do we do with that? What do we do with that as believers, as Christians, or even seekers? What do we do with that? Does it mean we don't trust this book anymore? Does it, does it mean that it, it has some authority but not full authority? Or how do we take all that information and process it and still have a faith? This is a huge issue for us, massive issue. If you don't trust the Bible, what, what can you trust in a sense? How, how can you find out anything about Jesus if you can't believe what's in this book? What do you do with their concerns? What do, you, what do you do with consistencies and errors that they keep pointing out? What do you do? That's a huge question. And I believe it's all related to one of the biggest questions you and I face in life. What do I do with the Bible? What do I do with this book? What kind of authority should I give it? That's a massive question. And I believe it's one that each and every one of us should really struggle through and process and come to a hard decision about because everything's riding on it. This claims to be the guide, right? The, the light, right, to our feet, the, the guide down our path of life. This claims to be truth. What do we, what do, we do with all this other stuff? Well, it's, the good news is that we're now in a section of scripture in the Sermon on the Mount, or in Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus talks about his view. And this is what I believe is so important, is what is Jesus' view? I'm not so concerned where people that have an agenda, people that want the Bible to be wrong, I'm not surprised that they say it's wrong. But the question is, what did Jesus actually say? Because Jesus is one of the greatest teachers of all time, is he not? And so his view of the Bible, hey, that's really pertinent to me. But it's not only pertinent because he's a great teacher, because I, as a believer, see him as more than a teacher. I see him as the Messiah. I see him as God in the flesh. And so his view really matters to me because his view should be my view. I really believe that because his view is going to be right. <laughs> and I, I, I kind of want to be right. But also, I want to know his view because he's Lord which means he leads, we, we follow. That's the idea of lordship. And we're supposed to be becoming like him. We're supposed to be developing a heart like his heart. We're supposed to love the things that he loves. But it also says in Corinthians that we're supposed to be developing the mind of Christ. It's not just the heart. It's, it's the, the thinking. It's the perspective. It's this view. We're supposed to be viewing things like he views things. Because we're supposed to be coming like him. So what we're doing in this series is we're kind of just saying, okay, how did Jesus view the Bible? Because I want to develop my view. I want to have a firmer grasp of what this Bible is and what kind of authority I should give it and how I should use it in life. So if you have your Bibles, we're in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And I'm going to pick it up in verse 18 today. And uh, this is what Jesus said. He said, for truly I tell you, and when Jesus says truly, some people, maybe your translation has amen in it, a, a strange word there, amen, or verily. Uh, it's actually, Jesus did that. It was one of his teaching techniques. He would telegraph important stuff. Not that everything he said wasn't important, but there were some things that he thought were really important. And this was his way of saying, hey guys, this is going to be on the test. You may have not paid attention to anything else I've said, but hey, pay attention to this thing right here, because this thing's really important. And the way Jesus did it is he said, amen. Now, that seems strange to us, because we put amen at the end of things, end of prayers, right? We say amen at the end. It means so be it, or let it be, or it's like saying, that's right. Uh, 
Jesus would do it at the beginning of important statements and say, okay, pay attention, put down your phone and listen really carefully now. It was his way of just saying, zone in for just a second. And he said, hey, for truly I tell you, and then he's going to tell us what this huge thing is, until heaven and earth disappear. Now that's heaven in the big sense of heaven. Heaven, heaven in scriptures, there's Three heavens, right? You picked up on that. Uh, Paul talks about being, being in the third heaven. It's like the third heaven. I, I didn't know there were three of them. Because in Hebrew thinking, the sky is heaven. Where the birds are and the clouds are, that's the first heaven. And then there's the next heaven, which is the stars and the planets and all those galaxies, that infinite universe. That's the second heaven. And then there's the third heaven where God is, the throne, the angels are. And so he's saying, hey, until heaven, all of that, and then the earth, basically saying until all creation, everything I've made, until everything that I've made has disappeared, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law. And that's a way of talking about the Old Testament again. Will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. And that's him saying the same thing over again. Hey, there's going to be a time where the heavens and the earth are going to disappear. We're told that. The Bible tells us that everything is going to be unmade when everything is accomplished. Everything is going to be unmade and then remade. And he said, until that happens, until everything's accomplished like that, this is how much confidence and, and how much just sureness you can have in the Bible. He says, not by any means. That's a double negative in the, in the Greek. Double, no, no, don't even think about it. Not the smallest letter and not the least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear. Will go away, will we'll, we'll lose its meaning or, or de- lack its force. So he's talking about Hebrew, right? The Old Testament, the law is written in Hebrew. And, and the, the smallest letter is this tiny thing. It's called a yod. It's like our apostrophe. Now, apostrophes can get lost. I, I know I miss them. They're small little things, but there are 60,000 yods in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew text. He's saying, even that small letter matters, and it's there for a reason. And I'm telling you, not a single one of those 60,000 little apostrophes, those yodes, will by any means disappear from the Bible. And then he says, it's not just the yod, though. He says, not even the least stroke of a pen. What is he talking about? He's talking about that defining stroke of the pen that makes one letter another letter. We do the same thing in our, in our English, right? We have our O's, right? We make our loops. And with just a slight stroke of the pen, we can make those O's Q's. That's what he's talking about, those defining stroke, that, that little line in the bottom right-hand corner of your O. Making one letter another letter. He's saying you can trust this Bible. You can trust this Old Testament right down to the very letters God has used to write it, to communicate it to you. And that, that they are so solid and they are so sure you can say this, that not even one of those smallest letters, those yodes will disappear. And not even one of those little defining lines that separate one letter from the other will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished, until it's all done. And only then... Could you even think that it's possible for one small aspect of it to disappear and lose its meaning and God allow it to go? Jesus is saying you can trust this thing, this this crazy thing, this ancient text. You can trust it right down to the very letters that are used to spell the words. It is what God intended for it to be. And it will always be what God intended to be right to the very end until everything is unmade. Now that is a huge statement. That is a huge statement. And it flies in the face of of what we tend to believe 
in today's culture. For instance, right now, the trend, the, the culture is pushing on you is you, you can trust the Bible in the big things. And, and maybe it's a parable or, or maybe it's this myth, but it's telling us this bigger truth, these higher things. And Jesus said, no. It's not just about the high things. It's not just about the big things. It's not just about the meta narrative. This thing is true and accurate all the way down. Every, every layer of this onion that you want to pull down, all the way down to the individual letters that are chosen by God to spell the words. These are true and accurate, and you can count on them, and they will be there for all time. Wow. Wow. And so Jesus backed this up. Jesus says, hey, I trust this. I trust the Bible right down to the very letters that were chosen, meaning God picked the words to best communicate what he had in mind. And Jesus backed it up. So in his ministry, you'll find that Jesus trusted the Bible in all of its details. For instance, you know all those stories? In fact, there are, some, are there not some crazy stories in Scripture? I mean, they're right. That's the one thing the atheists are right by. They can make their list of the five or the seven or the 12 weird things they found in Scripture because, amen, there's some weird stuff in Scripture. There's no doubt. Nobody's ever going to debate that. But that doesn't mean it's not true just because it's weird. There's some weird stuff that happens, and it's true. And Jesus treated it as true. And so what's amazing is Jesus took all the stories of the Bible and he acted like they were historical fact. He, he would make points about them. He would say, this happened and this happened as if they were real historical events. And there are the events you and I struggle with most. One of the events that people struggle with absolutely the most is the flood. Noah and the flood. Right? Because the Bible claims that it was a global flood, that all the earth was flooded and it destroyed everything on the planet and just these few people these eight people escaped and it's only because the animals the land animals were on this ark that they survived and it's like hold it come on that's that seems hard to believe well when Jesus talked about the story he talked about it like it was no big deal like it was it's just it's what happened it's history and it's the truth and we all believe it and we all know it's true he treated it as true even though we struggle with it as true and if anybody knew whether it was true or not, it was him. And it's not just the story of Noah. Think about this. Another story we struggle with was Jonah, do we not? I mean, this guy running from God. Okay, I believe that part. But he gets on the boat and they throw him overboard and this fish comes along and swallows him? For three days? Really? Come on, really? And then spits him up on shore? And guess what? Jesus treated it like, yeah, that was just true. That's a true story. So even though we struggle, Jesus didn't. He, he saw every aspect, everything is just this historical, accurate thing that you could rely on. And he goes all the way back. That story about Cain and Abel, so many people, so many people want to think that's like a parable about brothers, you know, good and evil. And, and we want to make it into this bigger, you know, this meta-narrative again, rather than the details. And Jesus says, no, the details were, he talks about it like it's just a historical fact, like it really happened. And it doesn't matter what character Jesus talked about, because he talked about Abraham, he talked about Isaac, he talked about Jacob, he, he, he talked about David and Solomon, he talked about Elisha and Elijah. I mean, you can think about all these, and he treats them like they were real historical figures, and what happened to them really happened to them, just as the Bible tells us. <laughs> that should be really encouraging to us, because again, if anybody knew what really happened, it was him. These things are real, and Jesus treats them as real. And just because people out there struggle, just because they want to deny, and they got a vested interest in denying because they can throw off God's authority and deny God in their life. They want it not to be true. Just because they, they have their agenda doesn't mean we have to buy into it and adopt it. Jesus says it's true right down to that tiny little letter choice. You can count on it. It's reliable. You can hang your hat on it. But not only that, he based his arguments on it. 
when he was debating with the different groups, and boy, wouldn't it have been hard to be Jesus because somebody was always testing him. Somebody, somebody was always going after him. He had to be constantly on his guard. And he was always in these midst of these debates and he was so good about it and he was so on his game. In fact, he so impresses us with his wisdom, does he not, and how he handles it? One of these debates is with the Sadducees. And we have this joke, we say, well, they're sad, you see. And the reason we consider them so sad is the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in life after death. They, they, they believed that, that once you died, you were gone. And that's a common view today. A lot of people just be, believe you just, you just cease to exist. And the, the only way you continue to linger is in the minds of others, in the memories of others, because you're gone. So he's in this debate with the Sadducees about life after death. And you can see this in Matthew 22. And notice how he argues his point. Notice how he makes his point and what he says. Jesus replies, you are in error. Now, wouldn't you hate God to tell you that? That's basically what's happening. God in the flesh is saying, you got this all wrong, guys. You've got this twisted and messed up. You, you, You are just... You're full of stinking thinking. You don't have this right. You are in error. And he tells them why they're in error. And it says, because you do not know the scriptures. That's Jesus' attitude towards the Bible. If you want to know the way things really are, where do you go? The Bible. You're, you're mistaken because you don't know the Bible. And these are Sadducees. These are religious leaders. And he's saying, hey, even though you study this document your whole life, you still don't understand it. You still don't get it because you really don't believe it. You don't believe it's true. You are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God because, hey, God can sustain life even after death. The soul can go on, right? At the resurrection, he continues, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage because that's part of their document and whose wife this person will be. People aren't given in marriage at the resurrection. They're like the angels. They will be like the angels in heaven. Ever notice that angels are always guys in scripture? There aren't any ever any girls. So there aren't couples. Angels are never dating, I guess. They, they, they don't have any matchmaking apps. They just don't do that thing. It's not what they're about. And for some reason, in the after, we also will no longer be couple-driven he says, we'll be like the angels. We'll, we'll, just, we'll be comfortable not being in a couple. Verse 31, but about the resurrection of the dead, life after death, have you not read what God said? So he's going to make his argument. He says, you don't know the scriptures. And so he's actually going to quote a Bible reference now. He's going to quote a Bible verse. And notice which one he does. It's in verse 32. This is what God said to you. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And here he's going to sum it up. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. How how did he get that? He leaps to that conclusion based on a verb tense. Did you notice that? It's because God said, I am. I am the God of Abraham. He didn't say, hey, I was the God of Abraham. Because God's no, because Abraham's no more, I can no longer say am. And since Abraham still is, God says am. I still am. I was and I still am the God of Abraham. And I still am the God of Jacob. And I still am the God of Isaac because these guys are still alive. And Jesus takes this verb tense and says, hey, you can base a whole doctrine on this. That there's life after death. That there is a resurrection. Just based on the verb tense God chose to put in his word. I am the God of Abraham. You see how powerful this is? You see what Jesus is saying? He's saying that you can get into scripture and you can study it with a microscope. You, You can get as small as it gets. And you can go down to its littlest details. And out of those details, you can make conclusions. And those conclusions can guide your life. Even about the resurrection. That's what he's showing you. So Jesus treats scripture different than we're comfortable doing it. He's saying, hey, 
not only can you trust it as historical fact, all the stories in it you, you can treat, treat as true because they are true. But even the little words, the choices of the words matter. And God intentionally and intelligently chose even verb tenses that you can hang your hat on. And then even beyond that, in debate, it was his final say, was it not? Uh, when, he, when he was in any conflict, it was like, hey, the Bible says this, and that settles it. Well, how can you do that with a, with a, a text that you can't trust? That's only appropriate in somehow in this higher sphere of thinking and not down in the details. And so when he was tempted in the wilderness again, Satan was there, right? He always came back at him with the truth and said, hey, this is what Deuteronomy says. This is what God's word says. He fought with it like it was solid and true. It was the sword. It was metal. It was solid. What Jesus is saying is that we can trust the Bible down to its smallest details. And this is going to be hard for us to stomach in this day and age where so much, so many attacks have gone against it. But this is the way Jesus treated it. This was his attitude. This was his view. And again, who knows better? Who knows better, him or us? The question I get a lot, and I've heard it expressed in all sorts of different ways, but that may be true, Mike, that, that Jesus really relied on his Bible, the Bible of his day, and he really trusted it. But that Bible is no more. I mean, it's changed, right? And then inevitably, they'll say something like this, just like that game of telephone. I can't tell you how many times I hear that, and it frustrates me every time because it's so misunderstood. There's a myth there, and there's a lie inherent into it that we have bought into, and we actually take that as true. You ever play the game of telephone? You ever do that? So I remember doing that in youth group and us getting all in a line, right? And they had a message at one end and they'd whisper it in a person's ear. And then the next person would whisper it in the next person's ear and down and down and down and down and down the row, all the way to the end. And by the time it got to the end, the message was a mess. And the whole premise of this was the Bible is transmitted what? Orally. What a lie. The Bible hasn't been transmitted orally. Why do we say that? Why do we believe that? Why do we allow them out there to say, hey, the Bible was transmitted orally? When? You, you, you go back to the first five books with Moses. Did, did he go up to Joshua and say, hey, Joshua, memorize this. I'm going to repeat it in your ear, and you got to memorize it for the next generations. Or does the Bible tell us that Moses wrote it down? Weren't there something about tablets up on a mountain where it was written down? Why do we buy this lie that says, oh, it's orally transmitted? When? When was it orally transmitted? Just give me a time in history when the Bible was transmitted orally. It's right from the very beginning it was written. And that's why Jesus said the least, what? Stroke of a, of a pen. He doesn't say the, the least smallest syllable spoken. He talks about the least stroke of a pen. Why? Because these people wrote it down. It's not like a game of telephone. Stop buying that. Stop thinking that. And don't let people say that anymore. That's such hogwash. The Bible has been written from the very beginning. And it continues to be written. In fact, the Jewish people were so serious about that. They guarded it and secured it. And they were very careful copying it. They were working with the word of God. So does it, you think they're just going to flippantly just, hey, it doesn't matter. They treated it with incredible respect. And we got proof they do. We got proof. We got incredible proof just after World War II. It was, it was 1946 and 1947 because there were two discoveries. Totally by accident, we found caves around the Dead Sea with scrolls in them. There were these clay jars, and in these clay jars were these ancient scrolls, these old scrolls, and a lot of them were Old Testament scrolls. In fact, there was an almost intact full book of Isaiah. 
It was an incredible find. It, it was one of the most incredible archaeological discoveries of our time. It was absolutely massive. Well, these scrolls date back a thousand years before any other scrolls we had at the time. So they were a thousand years older than what we had to work with. They date back, notice these dates, between 150 B.C. and 70 A.D. Who lived in that time period? Hmm. Jesus, right? These were the scrolls that Jesus would have had access to. And he treated them at the time like they were absolutely right to the very letter choice. And so we archaeologically were given a gift so we could go and we could look at these fragments of the broken scrolls and this Isaiah scroll and we could look at that and we could compare these ancient scrolls back from Jesus's time with the ones we have today and guess what we discovered there was no game of telephone right there was no game of telephone are there slight textual variances? Of course, scribes made errors. They, they also noted those errors at times and eventually got very good at documenting those errors because you just make a mistake and you don't have a Xerox machine and they didn't have erasers. So they'd have to, oh, messed up here, and they'd correct it. So there are textual variants. We will talk about that. But they do not... They do not affect the meaning of the text. And we have so many manuscripts, so many of these scrolls that we can compare and contrast. And we can get to, hey, this is what was. This is what Jesus was dealing with. And Jesus trusted this. So what about the changes? There really aren't any. It's a, it's a myth. It's a lie. That the culture wants to keep saying, but we got to say, hold it, that doesn't work. These were written. But what about the human element, Mike? Okay, all right, all right. Let's 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 grant let's grant the archaeological evidence that okay, these are really, really, really without really significant change from what Jesus had. So so we if he buys them, we should buy them. But what about the human element? Weren't, weren't these books written by humans, though? And don't humans make mistakes? And, and, and shouldn't, we just, shouldn't we factor in a human element here? That's a great question. Because, hey, there, the book was written, the Bible in total was written by about 40 different people. Right? 40 different authors. And there's 66 of these books in the Bible. And not only that, they have this massive span of time, about 1,600 years worth of time, from the first one all the way to the last one. So, so there's a lot of room for different perspectives and different ideas, different worldviews. There's the whole you know, style thing and then error thing, and it's just going to happen because they didn't have Microsoft Word to correct everything. Good point, good question, but let me, let me tell you what the Bible says about this. So, so uh, the second Peter thing, is it gone? There it is, second Peter. Second Peter chapter one. So Peter's talking about the Bible, and he's saying about this problem about the human element, and notice what he says. He says, above all. So that's Peter's way of saying amen, amen, or very truly, or hey, Pay attention, this is going to be on the test. Above all, of everything I've said, if you're going to forget it, okay, but this is the one thing you should get. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture, and right there, let's stop. Because we got this crazy thinking in our culture today that prophecy is this narrow thing of predicting the future. That's not what prophecy is. That is a type of prophecy and it may be the one we most like to talk about. But prophecy, scripture-wise, is when anybody spoke for God. If you, if you had a word from God, you were called a prophet, were you not? And what do prophets give you? Prophecy. So all of the Old Testament is considered prophecy because it all comes from a prophet. Moses being a prophet. First five books, right? All the way through to Malachi. They're all prophets, and so when Peter says no prophecy, it says basically saying, hey, when anybody claimed to speak for God in Scripture, which all of it is, 
you got to understand that no prophecy, no, none of those times that anybody ever claimed to speak for God, and there were a lot, there were 40 guys in 66 books, no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. So none of that came about because of their own personal preferences, ideas, and perspectives. Why? For, for prophecy never had its origin in human will. It never originates. It didn't originate. It didn't originate with Peter in his books or Paul in his books or Moses in his books. It didn't originate with them. We don't believe in that. For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets again. Anybody who claimed to speak for God, though they were human, I, he acknowledges the human factor. Though they were human, spoke what? From God. In fact, what was the test of prophecy in the Old Testament? For a prophet to be true, they had to get everything 100% correct. And if they ever made a mistake about anything, they were dismissed as a prophet and they were killed. It's a pretty high bar. And that's what Peter's saying. But prophets, though humans, spoke from God. You had to have the very word of God. Spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's inspiration. And the idea is a, sh is a ship with sails being carried by the wind. The Holy Spirit's blowing them, inspiring them, working through them so that they wrote down not their own words. What did they write down? They wrote down God's words. So yes, there is a human element to this, but we dismiss it because we believe that God inspired them to write the very words they did. And that's Jesus' attitude. You can trust this right down to the word choice. They're more than that, right down to the very letters they used. They were the letters God wanted them to use. This is where we get the idea of verbal inerrancy. This is a concept in Christian circles that we talk about. That, that we can trust the Bible right down to the very words that are chosen. And we get it because of what Jesus said. That you can trust it right down to the very letters that were selected for the words that were put in it. And they came from God. They were God-breathed. They came out of his mouth, not the prophet's mouth. This is huge. But there's a couple twists to this. So let, 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 me, let, me, let me put this in perspective. The first one is this. When, when, when Jesus was talking about, hey, you can trust this down to the smallest letter and the least stroke of the pen, he was talking about Hebrew, right? Well, mostly Hebrew. There's some Aramaic in the Old Testament, but by far, it's a Hebrew document. And then when the New Testament came along, it's a Greek document, primarily. The inerrant text is in Hebrew, and it's in Greek. It's not in English. You have to remember that the book that you carry on your smartphone, or if you still do the archaic thing and you actually got a paper copy you use as well, this is a translation. And so you don't have any yodes in it. You, you don't have Hebrew in it. You have an English translation of Hebrew. And what God intended was not here, it was there. Now, I'm not saying you can't trust this. I'm saying you should trust it. But what's considered inerrant in Christian circles is not this. This is a translation. What's inerrant down to the very words is the Hebrew and the Greek. What does that mean? It means that, hey, most of us aren't Hebrew scholars and most of us aren't Greek scholars, so we use this, and that's okay. But if there's ever a question or if there's ever any fine-tuning, where do you got to go? You got to go to the original manuscripts. That's what's inerrant. That's what's in the actual words that God dictated. God did not dictate in English. And I don't care, I don't care if you have a King James Version or, or, or an NIV they're a powerful tool because they've been put in a language you can understand. But the inerrant text, the one that's accurate down to the very letters, is not this. It's the Hebrew and the Greek, the original text, 
that is inerrant. Do we trust this? Yes, because <laughs> we have all sorts of scholars helping us try to understand the intent of that original text in a way we can understand it. But that's why when you hear sermons, and if you go out and read scholarly material, they're going to go out and they're going to talk about what the Hebrew says and what the Greek says, because those are the words God chose. And those are the meanings we need to grasp. And that's why I talk about the word amen in this sermon today. Because we need to understand that idea of truly. You can count on it. So, the inerrant text, the one that we, right down to the very word choice, was the Hebrew and the Greek. But now there's another caveat. That original text, for instance, Hebrew, that original text doesn't even have vowels in it. So we got to be careful. So, Hebrew is constructed on three consonants per word. And they would put them together, but they didn't write any vowels in those ancient texts. So there's no E or A's or I's or O's based in our standards. A-E-I-O-U, right? Vowels. But they put the consonants, and you had to guess what vowel went in its place. So for instance, just to use an example, in our ball versus bell, they have the same consonants, B-L-L. -L, but they have very different vowels, an A versus an E. And so... Those vowels were not in the text. But context tells us, well, you, you ring. Do you ring a bell or do you ring a ball? And so scholars can go in and say, okay, the word here is ball or bell based on the context. And so there's multiple words for the same three consonants. So we got to remember that. And on top of it, if you go to the Greek text or the Hebrew text, there's no punctuation in it. It wasn't invented yet. There's no commas. There's no periods. In fact, there are these incredible run-on sentences in Scripture that your English teacher would have fits about. Right? It's just it's the way they wrote. Now, it's inspired. God wanted it that way. But it's just the way it was versus the way we do things. So they didn't have punctuation. And guess what? There were no titles. There was no Genesis at the top of the first book. We added that. That's not an error. There's no, there were no titles in any of the books. They just started. And guess what? There were no chapter numbers and no verse numbers. They're not in there. We added those as tools to help us find stuff and be able to correlate stuff. And they're incredibly helpful, right? Chapters and verses. We need those numbers. And believe it or not, believe it or not, even that section at the very end, maps, it wasn't there. It wasn't part of the original text. We added those as tools, right? Helpful. So we got to be careful. Yes, is this Bible true? Absolutely. Right down to the very words chosen in the original Hebrew and the original Greek. Absolutely. Those words were very specifically chosen. Among all these words, he chose that word in that spot because it conveyed the meaning that God was after. And we can trust it right down to the smallest letter or the least stroke of a pen. And so this leads to another caveat that you just need to know about. There's a whole field of study about this, right? You have, you have thousands upon thousands of these ancient manuscripts. And, and you have these scholars pouring over these ones without vowels, right? And, and, and you have them comparing and contrasting and looking at this textual variant over there. And if you look at your Bible carefully, if you go to those footnotes, often those footnotes are, hey, the oldest manuscript doesn't have this word in it does it change the meaning of the text no not really but there's a textual variant you just need to know about it and some texts are older than others and they, they it's really it's way more complicated than the average person wants to know about but yet those texts those original texts, that, that, that writing from Moses was exactly what God wanted Moses to write down to the very words. And the problem is, is those texts from Moses, those original manuscripts, they don't exist today. Right? Makes sense? He wrote on papyrus or, or animal skin to make his scrolls. That's what they did for millennia. 
Well, they don't last. And so we don't have the original manuscripts. But we do have copies of copies of copies. And when we compare the age of those copies and we go back, it hasn't changed much, just slightly. And the meaning has not changed. So we can trust it. This is why, <laughs> this is why we send people that want to go to the ministry to seminary. And this is why a seminary worth their salt will make sure anybody getting a ministerial degree is going to get a couple semesters of Hebrew and is going to get a couple semesters of Greek because they're going to have to have a foundational understanding of these original texts, these, the, these languages that they were written in. But can you trust them? Absolutely. Can you trust your English translation? Yes. But when there's questions, where do you got to go back? To the originals, to the original languages. Now, if you want to read more about this, if you want to study more about this, because it is way more complicated than I'm talking about today, there is this incredible document that I highly can endorse. It's called the Chicago Statement of Inerrancy. It is a bunch of scholars in our lifetime got together and said, what does this text mean? What was Jesus saying? What, what does inerrancy really mean? And they put together this document, it's just a few pages long, that goes through all these caveats about original languages and manuscripts and all of that, and basically say, you can trust the text to say what it said. So what does that mean? It means we should read poetry like it's poetry. And we should read history like it's history. And that, that, that if it talks about uh, all this flowery language and poetry, it's probably not literal, it's probably hyperbole, but it's truth, but it's poetry truth. And then if you have history, is that truth? Yes, it's much more factual, regimented, and yes, it's absolutely right down to the dates you can count on it. But you need to read it like it was intended in the original language in the voice that it was intended. So Mike, what about the errors then? What about all these errors? What about, what about the atheists and their errors or inconsistencies? There aren't any. There aren't any. In fact, it is such a big deal that apologists, that remember I said there's a whole area of study out there? There's an area called a, apologetics, which is a defense of the faith. It's, it's giving people the reason why we believe what we believe and why it's reasonable to believe what we believe. And this book by Geisler and Howe is entitled When Critics, Critics Ask. And they systematically go from the first verse of the Bible that anybody ever complained about and found a problem with, and they go all the way through the last verse of the Bible, and they talk about the error somebody said was there or the inconsistency between it and something else or whatever, and they explain it. Because everyone is explainable. Typically, the errors people say are there is a lack of knowledge, a lack of insight. Really, it, they're, they're really based in ignorance. They don't understand the Bible enough to, to critique the Bible. And so when they do critique it, they, they don't have enough information to cr critique it and really get anything right. And so scholars have these books. This is just one. And then you can see it's a decent-sized book. And it just systematically goes through every Bible verse that anybody ever had a problem with. And it explains the problem and why people have a misunderstanding about it and what it really means. Because this is my experience. The inconsistencies, I have yet to find one. Error, I have yet to find one. And I've had people point them out to me and they're all easily explainable once you understand the Bible well enough to explain them. There aren't any errors. Plus, on top of it, if that's not enough, the Bible has proved itself over and over. It's proved itself archaeologically, historically. As I've already said about the Dead Sea Scrolls, this is, this is what Nelson Gluck said. You may have never heard that name, but he is a scholar. He's very reputable when it comes to these things. He said, it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever, ever controverted a biblical reference. Every time we have a problem with Scripture, I remember early on in my faith, people were questioning whether David was even a true historical figure or he was a myth or a legend like King Arthur. 
And then it seemed like 20 years later, they found an archaeological discovery, a, a bronze tablet where David was mentioned by name. And he, boom, suddenly he's a true proven character, a historical figure. This has happened over and over where people have questioned the Bible, especially Luke, it seems like. People have problems saying, oh, this never happened. And when archaeological evidence is discovered, guess who's right? The Bible's always right. Always right. It has been proved over and over. History has proved that you can trust your Bible. The other thing that's true is prophecy has proved your Bible true. Jesus fulfilled 300 plus prophecies just his first appearance the first time he came now there's a lot more he's going to fulfill but he he fulfilled 300 of these the first time and they were things he couldn't control like like who his mom was and and where he was born things that 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 you would think the average person can't manipulate and control in their lifetime and he fulfilled more than 300 and the statistical probability that are through the roof it is true historically the prophecies have come true so far. But also there's this unity. Isn't it amazing that 40 people, 40 different authors over 1,600 years wrote this book and yet it has the same doctrine throughout? That it has the same perspective of God? That, that it's this consistent document that you can jump and check the book by itself Jumping all the way back to the Old Testament or jumping right back to the New Testament. It has this internal consistency and unity that is improbable and impossible to understand unless you get this, that it was all inspired by one author, God himself. That's why it's whole and that's why it's unified. And then lastly, you can trust that book because through the ages, there are people like you and me that have read this book and your life has changed. That this truth has spoken into your heart and your mind. And it's, it's catalyzed. God has used it to make you into a different person. This book has power. This is, this is not just a book. It's the Bible. And it's why it's still the greatest selling book of all time. And that's with the concerted effort to undermine it. That's because, hey, when you really get to it, this book's got to be true. Jesus said it was true. He said you could trust it right down to the smallest letter or the least stroke of the pen. But all of this shows over and over and over again that it is the work of God. And so, Mike, what do I do? What do we do? Every one of us has got to get to a point where we change order in life. Everybody struggles with this question about the Bible, and you should. But eventually, the evidence is so overwhelming and so conclusive, and and, 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 and you just finally get to a point where, in faith, you finally change the order of authority. So this is what we typically do, and this is what scholars do, the the cultural scholars do. They put themselves up here as the greatest thinkers of, of, of the ones that are, they would call themselves objective and insightful, and they're the ones that really get it. They would put themselves up here, and they would look down on the Bible, and they would put the Bible underneath them, and they would question the Bible. They would critique the Bible. They would study the Bible in the sense of they're superior to it. And I think we all start out life that way. We all have this kind of attitude that we want to run our lives and we want to be Lord and we want to be on the throne and we want to do things the way we want to do it. So we put ourselves over the Bible. But there's a transition that takes place eventually as we grow in our faith where finally it hits us that this book... (laughs) I've put it in the wrong order. I've I've put me over the Bible. But eventually there comes this faith transition where I put the Bible over me. That I put the Bible above me. Where no longer do I question the Bible, but the Bible questions me. No, No longer do I criticize the Bible, the Bible criticizes me. That, that it has this authority because God gave it. It's God's voice. It's, it's his words. It's his revelation to us. And so eventually, 
I need to submit to it. I need to honor it and I need to respect it just the way Jesus did. I need to put it in its proper place in my life. Not me questioning it, but it questioning me. I need to put it above me because it's the very word of God and I'm not God. And one of the greatest things you can do is settle the debate and change the order. And let the Bible to start speaking in your life as if it's absolutely true and accurate and has the authority from God because it's his words to speak into your life and be the guide the Bible says it is, to be the light <laughs> that it says it is, to be the very word of God that it says it is. But that's a faith. That's a faith decision. You're never going to get enough proof. That's my experience. God wants us to live by faith. And there's all sorts of proof, but you'll never have enough. Eventually, you've just got to take it in faith and say, okay, this is Jesus' view, so it's mine. This is the way Jesus treated the Bible, so that's the way I'm going to do it. And I'm done mincing around. I'm done playing around. I'm done being on the throne. And I'm going to let God be in charge. And I'm going to let his word speak into my life. And I'm going to guide everything by it. And I'm going to live by it. Because it is the very word of God. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you this morning that uh, you gave us something that we can hang our hat on. That it's absolutely tried and true. It's solid. It's, 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 it's accurate right down to the very letters chosen by you. And it, and it still has that authority. It still has that place. And, and not the least stroke of the pen and not the smallest letter will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Lord, we praise you for that. Thank you for that certainty. And thank you for modeling for us this attitude towards Scripture where we can just count on it. And we can live by it. We can treat it as fact. Help us to get to that faith step. Help us to get to that place where we flip, where we flip the order of things, where we stop putting ourselves above your word and start putting ourselves below your word. Help us to make that decision today to finally say, hey, this is the word of God and I trust it and I believe it regardless what all those other people say. I trust this because this is what you say. Lord, help us to believe and help us to trust and help us to see the great gift that it is that you chose to reveal yourself to us and you put it in writing. You had it written down thousands upon thousands of years ago so that we could know you So we could grow in you. So we could base life on truth. So we could live the way we were intended. So we could experience you and know you. Really know you. Thank you for taking the time. And thank you for ensuring that we can trust it. In Jesus' name, amen.